Hello, I'm Yvette Torres, and welcome to another edition of The Road to Recovery. Today we'll be talking about community health centers and first responders strengthening communities through education. Joining us in our panel today are Brenda Mannix, National Registry of Emergency Medical Technicians, Project Director, SAMHSA, Disaster Technical Assistance Center, Rockville, Maryland. Karis Myrick, Director of Consumer Affairs for the Center for Mental Health Services, Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration, U.S. Department of Health and Human Services, Rockville, Maryland. Dr. Donald Alves, Medical Director of the Maryland State Police and Emergency Physician at Johns Hopkins University Hospital, Baltimore, Maryland. Officer Michael Chinbloom, Crisis Intervention Team, Montgomery County Department of Police, Gaithersburg, Maryland. Welcome to all of you. Karis, what are community health centers and what impact do they have on our country? Sure. So community mental health centers, so I do used a new term on you, sorry about that, but you asked about community health centers, and there are a couple of different terms we could use. So community mental health centers, for example, are places that are in the community where one lives that provide mental health services, a full array of mental health services, from treatment services to recovery supports. Um, community health centers could be things like federally qualified community health centers, FQHCs, which provide primarily primary health care. Mm -hmm. um, and then there are some new programs called CCBHCs. Yeah, we love our acronyms, but so it's a certified community behavioral health centers, and these offer like integrated full array of services from access to uh, treatment, services support, can help with crisis stabilization, mental health, substance use treatment, um, uh, primary care, prevention care, and it's all done in a trauma-informed care with an emphasis on recovery and wellness. Oh, that's excellent. And those are funded by the Center for Mental Health Services? Yeah, they're funded by SAMHSA, the Center for Mental Health Services. And it's a new pilot project, so there are eight of them around the country. And then um, over time, they'll grow. Very good. Mm -hmm. Dr. Alves, how important are these centers to the community? They're really essential. Um, a lot of individuals, if they find themselves without resources, or if they're just out of jail, if they're new to the area, um, if they don't have primary care or mental health set up, they'll come into the emergency department, um, we'll do an assessment, make sure they're stable, we'll set them up with the community mental health centers for follow-up, we contact them, they'll either come see the patient in the emergency department or we can arrange transportation or follow-up at the, at the centers for them so that we can get them established. Very good, and some, a lot of them come in through the emergency personnel that brings them in. Yeah, a good percentage of them come in by 911 through, uh, through the ambulance services through EMS. Very good. Brenda, talking about EMS, what are EMS? What, it, what are first responders? Well, the term first responders actually encompasses both law enforcement officers as well as fire personnel and emergency medical technicians and paramedicine, paramedics. Um, our role in the community is to respond to the 911, it's public safety. Um, we also do a lot of public education, health education, um, injury prevention type demonstrations as well within the community. Particularly in schools, correct? In schools, at community events like uh, fairs, parades, hometown holidays. Very good. Officer Chinbloom, why is it important for first responders to know how to best manage individuals with a mental or substance use disorder? Well, a lot of the times we're, you know, we're getting calls for, you know, persons that are in crisis. Um, every every call we run is, is some sort of a crisis or another. So it's important for our first responders to uh, ne not necessarily be able to diagnose, but be able to recognize certain signs and symptoms, whether it be a thought or a mood disorder. And then uh, we want to take care of uh, that individual and really kind of figure out what the best dis disposition is for that person, whether it's, you know, do they remain at home? Do they go to an emergency facility such as a local hospital? Can we take them to uh, uh, the crisis center in Montgomery County? Um, do we, you know, provide resources for the family? So there, there's a lot of different uh, potential factors and options in there, but it's very important for the, us as, as police officers to, to um, understand and, and kind of 
be able to recognize those types of issues. And, and Montgomery County in Maryland is one of, I think I, I would say, one of the more prominent uh, police departments to have such a unit? Well, I, I may be a little biased on that, but uh, yes, I, I think we have one of the, uh, the best programs in the state. And what's the unit called? Uh, uh, my unit in particular is the Crisis Intervention Team. Uh, so we do a variety of tasks. We assist, uh, uh, we co-teach with our local crisis center. Uh, with uh, clinicians, crisis workers, and we uh, co-teach with our local law enforcement as well as our regional law enforcement and how to uh, identify resources and identify mental health issues. Very good. Dr. Alves, what is the extent, let's start talking about some of the crisis that, uh, that first responders are dealing with, um, particularly as we look at the opioid overdose epidemic. And, and in the United States, really, not just in, in our area. So what role do first responders play in preventing deaths from opioid overdose? They're, the first responders' interventions are essentially are immediately life-saving. Um, they encounter a, an individual who's taken too much of their opioid of choice and has stopped breathing or is barely breathing and not adequately to save their life or to maintain their life. They'll give them naloxone or Narcan usually intranasally. Um, my troopers do that. Many of the law enforcement jurisdictions do that. And they're, since they're out on the street, they often get there a couple minutes ahead of EMS. And the extra couple minutes is time that individual doesn't have to essentially hold their breath. Very good. And, and, and that is the ideal scenario. But Brenda, is everyone trained about the use of naloxone? And In Montgomery County Fire and Rescue Service, absolutely. And that includes all of the volunteers. We go through the same training as the career paid folks do. Um, it's something we recertify every year as well and practice, it's something we do on a drill. We also, unfortunately right now, are using it on every shift. Really? Yes. Very interesting. Uh, Brenda, is your program that you, well, tell, tell us a little bit about the program that you're connected to that, that is supported by SAMHSA. The Disaster Technical Assistance Center? Mm -hmm. So our role is to provide support to SAMHSA and states and communities um, around planning for, preparing for, and responding to disaster disasters, but from the behavioral health uh, aspect. Okay. So we look at a range of things. We also are providing support on, we're doing some work right now with first responders on behavioral health emergencies or crises Such in the community. Such as the opioid epidemic, for example? Yes, we've talked about that. Uh, we have a uh, training course that we've developed for SAMHSA uh, that's free for any first responder. Um, so we're working on getting that released very soon, we hope. And that will be available nationwide through your web pages? Or? Through SAMHSA's website, we hope. And yes, it's online. It's free. Um, we hope it will provide a good overview and provide some very practical tips for working with individuals in a behavioral health crisis. We do talk about mood disorders, thought disorders. We talk about some of the substance use. Um, crises that occur. Uh, uh, so I think that it's going to be a very practical tool that people should walk away with an immediate confidence that they're, they're, they, they know more and they can do something effectively. Very good. Karis, related to um, natural disasters that Brenda just, just mentioned, um, it's terrific that we have the, uh, the center to be able to deal with communities. Um, but tell us a little bit about what types of, of mental health supports do communities need when, we, when they experience one of these crises? Well, I think um, there are um, different types of information and trainings that um, community members can take a part in. So just as a layperson in the community, if you're in a natural disaster, there's going to be a lot of um, emotional response, psychological response, trauma response. So, um, you know, you can we can look to our quote unquote licensed professionals to help us with that. Or there are things like mental health first aid um, that people can take. And on the SAMHSA website, there's a mental health, there's uh, information about mental health first aid. So um, just like you would offer CPR to somebody who's having a heart attack, you would want to be able to offer some support to someone um, who may be going through an emotional response to either disaster or traumatic um, experience, or just who happens to be in some kind of um, stress, um, having a stress response. And what does our audience and communities need to understand related to the post-traumatic stress disorder that can 
uh, that people can experience as a result of these natural disasters that people may say originally, well, you know, it's really okay, I'm okay, and mm -hmm. I really don't need to talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. Why would you encourage them to do it? Well, I think, you know, I like to think of these things as um, many people go through um, experiences um, and go through hard times. So the more that we can, quote unquote, normalize a person's experience so that they're open to talking to someone about what they're going through, um, I think that can help them work through some of the, um, quote unquote, post-traumatic post stress response that they may be having to a traumatic event. So um, being with someone, encouraging them, supporting them, you know, even going with them to an appointment, um, I think can be um, incredibly helpful. Also talking with somebody who's been there, done that, like a peer, um, is also um, very helpful because then it makes you feel less alone. Um, like, wow, you know, that person went through it too. I don't feel so alone. Um, they certainly understand and have walked that um, experience in their own shoes. So, Very good. And when we come back, we're going to continue to talk about best practices that support the work of not only community health centers, but first responders. We'll be right back. The U.S. Department of Health and Human Services defines serious mental illness as a diagnosable mental behavior or emotional disorder that causes serious functional impairment that substantially interferes with or limits one or more major life activities during the past year. People with serious mental illness are more likely to be arrested and experience homelessness compared to those without mental illness. Individuals with serious mental illness may also experience difficulties and crises that concern others enough to call emergency services. Therefore, police officers and other first responders may routinely encounter and interact with people with serious mental illness. First responders must be able to recognize signs of mental distress and apply proven techniques for de-escalating potentially dangerous situations. Technical assistance is available to support training efforts in these areas. Mental Health First Aid for Public Safety provides police officers and other first responders with more response options to help them de-escalate incidents and respond to related calls appropriately without compromising safety. In communities across the country, first responders are saving lives every day by using the opioid overdose reversal drug naloxone. SAMHSA has supported their vital efforts by providing the Opioid Overdose Prevention Toolkit, which equips communities and local governments with the material they need to develop policies and practices to help prevent opioid-related overdoses and deaths. SAMHSA's Grants to Prevent Prescription Drug Opioid Overdose-Related Deaths program supports the training of first responders and other community members on the prevention of opioid overdose-related deaths. The program includes funds for the purchase and distribution of naloxone to first responders. It takes many hands to build a healthy life. Recovery from mental and substance use disorders is possible with the support of my community. Join the voices for recovery. Visible, vocal, valuable. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. Welcome back. Brenda, I want to go to you to talk to me about the if there are any improvements in providing training to emergency personnel in the area of behavioral health. Well, I think it's something that we're all paying attention to very closely now as we've seen a, an increase in these needs. Um, we have regular calls. We have a lot of people that we see frequently through the emergency and 911 system, and so providing more care and more training on that care is really important. Um, I know through the SAMHSA Disaster Technical Assistance Center, we worked with first, res first responders to develop the course and to meet their, their needs, uh, seeing that there was really a lack of, of training uh, available to many of the departments. And so you're training not only police officers, but you're training fire personnel? And emergency services personnel like EMTs and paramedics as well. 
So the cool thing about that work is that um, it, involved, uh, it involved people with lived experience of mental health and substance use conditions as part of the training um, with uh, first responders. So it was really interesting because um, as we talked about our personal experiences of either being in, in crisis, having to dial 911 and having someone come to help us, we could talk about um, what did that feel like, what was important, um, things to do, things to try to avoid doing. Doing, like maybe you know slow down or be a little bit more patient because sometimes when you're in crisis it's harder to get out and talk about what's happening to you at the time so working together with um, both the person with lived experience a family member and the first responders it made the training quite robust as far as um, how best to work with folks who are experiencing a crisis and officer chin bloom it is imperative isn't it that that particularly uh, those uh, in a situation uh, that we have seen in this country uh, have this type of training because we've seen that many instances individuals with a mental illness are approached and 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 oftentimes the response is inappropriate to say the least uh, in in those cases so how can we uh, begin to get more police departments to understand that they need to have such a training with law enforcement in general, you know, we have to learn to ad adapt and, and you know, uh, to our community. We have to we have to change our training every so often. So, uh, you know, Montgomery County specifically, we've been encountering more calls for mental health service, um, but we also have an abundance of resources. There are a lot of jurisdictions out there that don't have those different types of resources, and that's very unfortunate. So. I don't, I don't have uh, an answer specifically, but if, if we were to have some form of training, whether it be mental health first aid or whether it be crisis intervention training, you know, give those officers a foundation, a basis, because, you know, a lot of times when we do respond to situations, you know, it's kind of, it's very fast, you know, and, and, and it evolves very quickly. So as Kara said, we do have to learn how to slow it down. So it is, as you said, it is very imperative that we have this training. So within the crisis intervention team that you have, if an officer in Montgomery County, for example, encounters an individual that may be displaying some type of violence because they, and we haven't determined whether or not they have a mental illness or whether they're in under the influence. Does that officer, are they, are you, do you train them to call in and say, I may have a situation here that I need help with? We, we do. Um, part of our training is, like I said, we're not doctors, uh, but we are frontline social workers. So, you know, once you get on scene, you want to be able to assess your situation. In Montgomery County, we do have, we are fortunate where our backup of other responding units are very close by. So part of the crisis intervention training is to, is to take a step back, assess the situation. If you're able to develop a rapport with that individual, wait for your backup. Um, obviously, if, if it appears to be some sort of medical issue or drug-induced issue, contact fire rescue services immediately to get them started so that when we do finally get that person into protective custody, you know, we can give them the appropriate treatment they need. Very good. And Brenda, related to this, do we have to have like a policy within uh, uh, emergency departments or police units to begin to really get them to address these situations that we Karis was just presenting or or should it be something who should start the dialogue about expanding these uh, uh, trainings well I think the honestly the first responders the frontline officers are starting the dialogue themselves we were actually really happy to learn as we were doing the the pre-work for this course and met and spoke with a lot of first responders from all three of the disciplines and there was a real hunger for this information because it's something that's occurring in their communities very often. And like Officer Chin Moon mentioned, that there's many, many uh, departments, whether it's law enforcement or fire and rescue, uh, that are not as well resourced as Montgomery County is, or even this jurisdiction in general in the, in the Prince George's, Washington, D.C., even the Northern Virginia areas are, are very well resourced in that, so, but many of them are not and can't afford some of the more expensive trainings that are available. A CIT, or the Crisis Intervention Training, is actually considered the best practice, but it's 40 hours. And for a very small department with a few officers or, a very, or an all-volunteer force that is fire and rescue, which most of them still are in this country, it's really hard to afford that from a departmental budget 
uh, from giving them leave to do that kind of training. Um, and for volunteers, that training is often something they have to pay for themselves, and they just can't afford the training. Well, Brenda, for, forgive me, but it, it, does it um, do the emergency personnel get training when they volunteer? Is, is, there, is there a procedure or a protocol? Could we be minimal. thinking about very minimal? Could we be thinking about including perhaps some of the behavioral health components to that training? We should. The National Registry for for EMTs test or exam actually includes a module on behavioral health emergencies, but it's out of the entire course. It's I think it was maybe an hour um, out of 180 hours of training. Or so it was about a maybe an hour was spent in class on it, and then in, in the station houses, we often do drills uh, to continue to keep our skills up. And I don't know that we see a lot of behavioral health drills. I think I, I care very much about this issue. So on my shift, I make sure we do these types of drills um, and that we practice them. And we're trying to work on how to have a communication. And I think Officer Chinblum gave some great answers about how to build that rapport and build a relationship. Assessing the scene, we have to do the same thing for our own safety, for that, pay, that person's safety. So I think those are things that are critical to get into training. From a national perspective, it would be great to see some leadership um, encouraging uh, the national certifying bodies uh, to build this course or build this information and make it stronger. Thank you, Brenda. Uh, Karis, so how difficult is it to get, for example, something as simple as mental health first aid? Well, you can go on a website, you can Google mental health first aid, for example. Uh, you can go on the SAMHSA website and you can actually find the uh, where the courses are offered. Um, and then they're offered at the community level. So it's probably not that hard. It is a commitment of time for folks to do it. And how many, uh, is it oh, the 40 hours? You no, know, I don't know how many it's hours eight. it is. Eight is hours. it eight, eight hours? hours. Okay. Yeah, eight Thank hours. You. So it's, it's eight for mental health first aid. For uh, mental health first aid, it's eight hours. And you really do learn a lot around sort of uh, mental health, substance use, what are some of the signs and symptoms, what are some of the um, warning signs. It teaches participants how to create an action plan with the person that you're supporting um, and to help them get, um, again, access to treatment services and supports. And I use those three words because treatment may be more around um, uh, seeking out a psychiatrist or a psychologist. Services and supports may be around housing, education, employment. A lot of those different things are the other, the, they're the whole aspect of your life. So if those things aren't going well, if I don't have housing, my mental health is probably not going to be at its best. Or I may be using substances, for example. So if you can access um, like housing first and getting to housing. Um, so mental health first aid does teach um, about uh, connecting folks to those treatment services and support. So it's a, it's a broader uh, pool of uh, yeah. information that people yeah. have. Yeah not just how to handle situations. Yes. Uh -huh. Very good. And when we come back, we're going to continue to hear from some of our other panelists related to best practices. We'll be right back. The other crisis intervention team started in, and well, in 1987, there was a, this, a incident where a, a young African-American male was killed uh, who was suffering from a, a, a psychosis. And uh, at the time, we knew very little about uh, mental illnesses or anything like that. So as unfortunately, uh, we ended up taking his life. Uh, he was on with a knife and we ended up shooting him. The traditional ways of intervening don't work as well with individuals who have various types of issues that could be characterized as behavioral or substance abuse related. It's always important to have a uh, to be uh, quicker to listen and slower to react. There was a, a, a collaboration of city leaders, uh, uh, University of Tennessee health science leaders, uh, community activists, uh, NAMI, mental health agencies. They came together and said, hey, we've got to do something better uh, than this. We need to talk about how we're going to deal with individuals suffering from mental illness. And, and basically, that's how CIT came into being. We want to be able to have individuals on the scene who have expertise in a very short time. We're, we're about 14% of our officers are CIT trained, active CIT officers. And we have CIT officers at all nine precincts. 24 hours a day, CIT is available. CIT is a, a, a very responsible and loyal group of guys and women. 
they're more considerate and kind and vulnerable. You know, they're, they're vulnerable as in they have heart, they're concerned about you and getting to see that you're all right too. We realize that it takes a special person to deal with someone who's suffering from mental illnesses. So therefore, the, they volunteer. Uh, after they volunteer, there's a strenuous uh, selection process and then there's a 40-hour training. The role playing is probably one of the most valuable parts of the training because in the role playing, we talk de-escalation. We talk de-escalation, we talk slowing it down. We talk giving the, 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 person, the person who's in a crisis, give them your undivided attention. CIT helps you open up because they're more supportive and they want you to talk. We change police procedures a lot. That is that this officer now who has the expertise might be in the patrol division, but he becomes the leader at the event in the net, as soon as it's determined that we have a behavioral crisis. So that we give them authority that we don't give other officers. We're there to give them a bridge from crisis to a place of getting help. These people are good. They understand what you're going through and they'll help you in the way they can. It's probably one of the most rewarding things I've done on this job, and, I, and I've done a little bit of everything on the job. But you know, there's nothing like helping somebody. My family and friends are always with me, no matter where I may be. Sharing stories from home helps me sustain my recovery from my mental and substance use disorder. Hey Hi, Join the voices for recovery, our families, our stories, our recovery. For confidential information on mental and substance use disorders, including prevention and treatment referral, for you or someone you know, call 1-800-662-HELP. Brought to you by the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services. So my recovery journey is one that, um, it's not quite that simple. Um, I think it took a while for me to, number one, understand that there was this thing called recovery. I'd never heard of it before. When I you know, got the diagnosis of, uh, at first it was depression, then it was schizoaffective disorder, then it was schizophrenia, and I was like, uh, uh, what do you do with all of that over a period of time? So I really had to, um, number one, understand what was going on. And, and number two, kind of think about what's important to me. Was it important to know that I had the diagnosis or was it more important to me to figure out what is it that I want to do with my life? Because I wasn't very happy with my life. And I wanted to kind of get on with my life. I wanted to get back to work. I wanted to go back to school. And those are the things that I was articulating to my treatment team. And my treatment team was telling me, yeah, no, that's not going to happen. And that was really very difficult. Because um, if I'm not working, if I'm not challenging my mind, if I'm not engaged in meaningful activities, it actually made it worse. So no amount of therapy, no amount of medication, no amount of peer groups, none of that could really help until um, we were all working together to help me achieve those goals and dreams that I had set for myself. And I was reading an article um, and it was about what is needed in behavioral health in order to expand access to recovery for all Americans. And the person was writing about the need to focus on youth um, and increase youth engagement in um, behavioral health care, as well as in leadership and participation and for people of color. So I called the person, I looked him up, called the person, and he said, I'm gonna introduce you to someone who has the same diagnosis. She's an African-American woman and next time I'm in your town, I, I, we talked about when he would be there. He said, oh my gosh, he's gonna be there too. So we'll get you guys introduced. And when I met her, that's when I knew that it was possible. If someone has doubts about their ability to recover, Google lived experience. You know, just go on the internet and Google lived experience. Try to find um, another person, another family, and somebody who can be that mentor. Um, that uh, you know can uh, show show you you know by example that recovery is possible. Welcome back, Dr. Alves. We haven't talked uh, a lot about 
the intersect between the state police and the local police department and the types of training that state police get? I know that you are the director of medical services for the uh, Maryland State Police. Can you take us through the type of training that the state police have? The state police in their academy have a few hours of training um, at the outset, and it covers specific topics, uh, Alzheimer's, suicidal behaviors and awareness, both in the community members we serve as well as amongst law enforcement, um, individuals that are different, individuals that are differently able, um, particularly like the deaf, if they're not responding to you, maybe because they can't hear you. Um, it plants the seed that also maybe because they don't speak your language, have no idea what you're telling them, um, things of that nature. And then it comes up reinforcement each year in their in-service training. Uh, but again, it's only you know a couple hours here and there. Um, there's optional trainings available, um, but most of those vary based on the officer's interest. Um, one of the biggest challenges as a state agency is that each barrack essentially functions as almost its own different police agency. If we're in a municipal area, uh, for example, the Rockville Barrack can key off of the resources of the Montgomery County Police Department. Um, and the programs they've established. If they're way out on the shore, up eastern, uh, sorry, out in the mountains, they may not have those resources available. They may not have any providers to partner with. Um, so it, it fluctuates area to area. And should we be looking um, even for state police uh, to, to n perhaps not making it mandatory, but making it more accessible so that they don't... I see here that, 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 that time is a factor in, in all of these. Um, it, it's a recurring theme that people just don't have enough time. Uh, are, are, are there ways that perhaps people can consider providing more, more training? Um, there definitely are, and it's going to be a functional availability and format. Um, do they come to the barrack? Is it something they can do online? If we can arrange self-paced training that, that adequately covers the material for novices or people that are not experienced in psychological emergencies or other medical issues. Um, that would be the most user-friendly in terms of access. They could get to it anywhere. They could get to it in their car if they're not working. I would also have to agree with that as well. I mean, you know, I'm from Pennsylvania originally, and when you look at a lot of the, the police departments in Pennsylvania specifically, there's boroughs, townships, but there's not a lot of mental health resources. You may have addiction resources. You may have individual hospitals. So trying to get those different agencies to come together when there may or may not be resources available is very difficult. Um, the whole... Um, auspices of CIT is the collaboration between the local police department as well as the local health and human services. That's what is really the core of the training. Local meaning Montgomery County or, or do you receive state aid as well? Um, that I honestly couldn't speak to. I know there is uh, aid that comes in from the state for our crisis center to assist with the trainings uh, for, for our agency as well as regional agencies, but you really need that collaboration there. So if, if you don't have those appropriate resources for your jurisdiction, Maybe something similar as online training, you know, would be would be appropriate. Just as as the doctor said, to start planting that seed to get people thinking. Because, um, and for an example, a, a call such as you know uh, uh, somebody behind the wheel that may be intoxicated, you know, we train our officers. That may not be intoxication. It may be a medical emergency such as a diabetic coma. So you need to slow down, take a breath, and evaluate and assess the situation. And it goes back to what you were saying yeah. with a first aid um, yes. type of training yeah. to, to slow down. Anything in addition, Karis, that SAMHSA is contemplating in light of the fact that we've established that time is a factor, we've established that the resources for training emergency personnel are scarce. Mm -hmm. I mean, I think um, what we're doing through Brenda's work is an example of how to shore up the gap so that the, the work actually is online self-paced. So it's not that you have to sit in a classroom for 40 hours straight or you have to go anywhere, quite frankly. You can actually do it 
while you're sitting at your desk. You can do it at home on the weekend. So um, that, that is a one way to help shore up. Um, I think the other thing to think about, and you know, SAMHSA has this work, um, and the states have it, and localities have it, is um, you know how to use your community-based organizations to help support throughout. So you know the the onus, if you will, can't be put on first responders. They can't be the only ones who are responding. So um, our community-based organizations, our peer-run organizations, recovery community um, organizations, also help become a part of the response as well as I think the prevention. Um, I think, I mean, I, I can speak from personal experience about the importance of officers having training um, and the difference between when I was not doing well and officers had to show up at my door when they didn't have training. It was not the best experience. It was actually quite traumatic. Um, and then, um, you know, and where I was from at the time, when the officers did go through the CIT training and an officer and a social worker came, it was a completely different experience. It was much more of meeting me as a person who was really having a hard time. And um, so I think, you know, again, speaking from personal experience, how important it is for everybody to have a better understanding of how to work with people who are um, experiencing distress. That's interesting. Um, I like the notion of what you said, peer coaches or, or peer support. Uh, Dr. Als, in the emergency department that you work in, do you have some peer support personnel that can actually, or access to calling them in to be able to help you out? We have, uh, at Bayview in the emergency department, we have uh, psychiatric social workers that are available to assess individuals, and we can consult them even if it's not a patient that's primarily there for those purposes. We can consult them on any patient and say, you know, I'd like to get this person additional resources in regards to substance abuse, psychological support, medication management, um, and they'll give us resources that we can then provide to the to the patient so that we can also get psychological follow up and it's an outpatient once we're once our visit is done. And Brenda, are we incorporating peer support into some of these um, concepts of training uh, or the use of peer support? Uh, our, our course, it's called Creating Safe Scenes, actually does have an entire module on building relationships within the community to provide additional supports and referral options. Um, I think it's really important, I think, you know, Karis made a really good point, it's really important to remember that the first responder has a very specific role and it's a very time limited role, but it can be an incredibly powerful role in terms of the experience of the individual in crisis. And so in the few minutes I might have them in the back of the ambulance, how I treat them and the opportunities I can show them that they might have for additional help beyond my their time with me um, can give them an experience that hopefully lets them know people care. Um, that there are, are options available to them and that you know we actually know where they are. So, and that's uh, something, it's gonna be very unique to each community, um, but I think the peer resources is going to be a key one um, because in some parts of the country, professional licensed psychological care is so scarce. Absolutely, absolutely. Um, Officer um, Chin Bloom, with all the stressors that come with people having to respond to crisis scenarios on a constant basis. What should we tell our audience uh, uh, that, that is engaged in this type of work? And, and where are the triggers of, of when to take pause and, and sort of self-care? So, you know, that, that's, that's a big piece, and that's especially over the last few years, the, you know, the, the spotlight has really been on law enforcement and interactions with the community, as well as it should be. You know, we should always reevaluate things. But I, I often say, you know, nobody calls us because they win a trophy that particular day. They call us because they are in a state of crisis, because their ability to reason and cope is so off kilter. It's, it's no longer, a, they're no longer able to, to deal with the situation themselves. So they contact us. Um, my personal experience, you know, it was very difficult at a certain point in my career, you know, I, I became physically and emotionally burnt out. So it, it's not always easy to evaluate your own self. Uh, you know, it's easy to give advice, but it's, it's very difficult to take it. So as first responders, it is very important that we are aware of our mental health, um, you know, our stressors, uh, what particular triggers, and it could be cumulative stress. It doesn't have to be necessarily a, a traumatic one traumatic event it can be an entire career 
you know, we often say in the academy, you know, you start out with a small duffel bag when you begin your career, and then by the end, you now have a gigantic suitcase that's overflowing. And unless you are aware of that and are able to deal with that appropriately, whether it's, you know, taking time off, whether it's proper diet, proper exercise, proper sleep, you know, also, we're also human too. We have families ourselves. So, you know, those different types of situations often you know, feed into our professional life as well. So it's extremely important, and I think a lot of police departments are now looking at that um, because of uh, recent events over the last few years nationally and locally as well. Very good point. And when we come back, we'll talk more about resources for first responders. We'll be right back. There's several levels in which I think the community has benefited in a pretty dramatic way. Okay, the fact that uh, people are um, are doing better, that are in crisis, that they're more likely to get in treatment, uh, they're more likely to be connected to treatment. Those kind of things are obviously very strong benefits. We answered 18,435 calls on last year, and out of those 18,435 calls, we only transported 529 individuals to a, a penal facility. The national average on transports is about two, somewhere between two. Uh, and 2.5. We're happy to say that our numbers were at uh, 0 .031 as far as transports. So what we're doing is that our officers are, are out there and we're, we're, we're thinking of other options other than taking individuals to jail because we realize that when they're suffering from mental illnesses, they don't need to be incarcerated. They need to be somewhere where they can get the help they need. We did find over the years that, uh, that the need for commitment dropped dramatically and that people were being diverted into community resources that were less restrictive, which we thought was a, obviously a very positive thing. We started CIT. It started right here in Memphis, Tennessee. I'm proud to say that. Since then, about 3,500 agencies have adopted the Memphis model of CIT. And, it, and it's growing. Uh, that's 3,500 agencies in, in the United States. That does not include the agencies outside of the United States. One thing that's nice about CIT is that the costs are very low and they don't need to be maintained. If you just get it started, it has enough energy and enough uh, strategies in it that they don't, they don't need additional funding. They really, they really do well. Knowing CIT is there to help you, you feel awesome and blessed. And, and you can feel that there is hope you know, still in this world. Keep doing what you're doing. It's working. <laughs> Just don't give up. Don't give up on, you know, on people. Section 223 of the Protecting Access to Medicare Act is uh, an effort that we believe is a game changer when it comes to community mental health and addictions treatment in America. And basically what this program does is establishes demonstration program to evaluate taking a federally qualified health center model and applying that to community mental health and addictions treatment, where these centers would meet certain quality standards and criteria that we established for them to provide a range of evidence-based quality care. As a result of those clinics providing that range of care, they'll be eligible for enhanced Medicaid financing. And what this really does is raises the bar when it comes in terms of quality and financing for community mental health and addictions treatment in this country like we haven't seen in some 50 years. One of the essential services that these community behavioral health clinics are to provide are crisis services. And so when a first responder, when a law enforcement officer or an emergency uh, medical technician uh, may encounter a person who's in a mental health uh, crisis or an addiction crisis, these clinics can be places where they can take these individuals where they can get seen, assessed, and provided the right level of care. And this is a win-win for everyone. The, the police, the EMTs may not have the necessary training, so bringing them to a location that has the necessary services, the expertise, it helps the individual 
they don't have to end up in jail or prison or end up in an emergency room perhaps and being boarded there for days at a time. Instead, they'll receive high quality care, ultimately helping them get back home into the community with their loved ones. For more information on National Recovery Month, to find out how to get involved or to locate an event near you, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov. Welcome back. Dr. Alves, Officer Chinbloom was mentioning self-care. Uh, what other tips do we need to be aware of for individuals that are first responders? First responders, law enforcement in particular, they tend to be very bad at paying attention to their own needs. They'll downplay those because they're in the middle of responding to an emergency. Um, so it's essential that we have peers that are trained as to what to look for for early signs of performance decrement or fatigue. Um, and the $5 word is compassion fatigue. Are you, are you getting to the point that you're just exhausted so you're not able to pay as much attention to the person that you're trying to help as you should? Um, and that way you have a trained peer who can kind of say, okay, we, we need to have a, have a glass of water and a cookie and sit down for a minute, um, take a break, and then go back in when you're ready to play. Um, it's very essential that the officers and the other responders feel that they can speak to their peers in a protected environment so that they don't feel like that's going to be used against them. Um, and that's the latest wave sort of in uh, the legislatures is to give peers protections the same way they would if they, if they found me on a scene and said, Doc, I just really feel X, Y, and Z. And you know, okay, we can fix that. You know, dust them off, turn them around, and put them back in play. So. Very good. Brenda, I still want to go back to the development of policies to make sure that emergency personnel are trained. Um, if I am out there and I'm part of this audience that's listening to this show, mm -hmm. Should I be going to my state health department, you know, obviously if I have an interest in, in making sure that my community first responders are trained in behavioral health issues? Well, I think each jurisdiction has its own rules uh, about what level of training they need and what that training content is. So I would actually start with your local department and, and check it out first to, to see what level of training they've gotten in behavioral health, how many hours it is, what it encompasses. Um, and then I think there's certainly uh, nothing that stops them from advocating for additional training, and, and most departments would probably support that. It, it's just needing the resources, identifying the resources, and, and making sure that uh, first responders have an opportunity to take advantage of them. Very good. Karis, anything to add on that note? Um, I, I think you can also work with local community um, uh, community organizations, you know, NAMI, National Alliance on Mental Illness. You can work with, again, recovery um, community organizations to also uh, uh, work with uh, uh, police uh, departments and um, departments of mental health or substance use SSAs to figure out, well, what is needed in that particular area and how can they support them. Is there a role for the community health centers and community mental health centers in this regard? Um, I think there's a role for everybody in this regard. I mean, um, again, I think uh, we were talking about self-care of, of officers as an, an, as an example. Um, you know, if officers are always responding to um, seeing folks in crisis, I think it's also important for officers to see folks when they're doing well. And um, for, for uh, people with lived experience to uh, work with officers when they're well and to, to meet them on their own terms, have coffee and a donut. I mean, mm -hmm. that's actually what we did at one of our community um, health centers uh, back where I'm from is, you know, our place was the place that folks could stop off and have um, coffee and a donut um, so that they could see people um, in treatment, see people when they're doing well, lots of hugs. You know, I've never seen so many hugs go around uh, between uh, police officers and, and people who were um, receiving services. But what I, what I found out from all of that was what it meant to the officer as well as what it meant to the folks receiving mm -hmm. services. They were more apt to see that person as a peace officer and a supporter versus somebody who might be kind of scary for them. And Officer Chin Woo, this is a, a very critical aspect of, of what we've been talking about because 
what Karis was just talking about really reduces what used to be called stigma and now is called discriminatory practices against those that may have a substance use disorder or mental health. Is there a need for that type of insight, uh, particularly for, for uh, uh, units that have a CIT program? So I'll, I'll answer that in two, two parts. The first part, uh, we talked about, you, you mentioned the stigma. That is a big part, uh, that's a big barrier uh, for law enforcement when it comes to dealing with our own mental health issues. Um, you know, we're afraid uh, if we step forward and say, hey, I'm having some issues, we're afraid for most of us, this is our livelihood, this is who we are, this is what we enjoy doing. And if we come forward, then we're saying we're not well, and then all of a sudden, maybe that career is gone. So breaking that stigma within our own agencies within, as police officers is incredibly important. And uh, for the second part of that, uh, my personal experience, we have a drug diversion program uh, within our county. I will personally tell you, I did not agree with it. I didn't see it as a success, but I will tell you now, I am a changed person. After interacting with these folks, after interacting with these professionals, um, it is working. Um, you know. It may not be the proper answer for, for everybody, but at least we do need to try something. And, and breaking that, that stigma, um, whether it be addiction, whether it be mental health issues, is extremely important for, for not just us as a law enforcement agency, but also within the community. You know, Karis had mentioned earlier about you know, bringing people in, that, uh, success cases. We don't see that that often. So you know, it, it's not a lot of, a lot of the... Um, the pressure gets put on law enforcement, but it's a community issue as well. And I think, uh, like as she pointed out, it, it, you know, everybody has to get involved. Very good. Anything to add, Bryn, on that? I think I would agree that the, in terms of self-care, it's more of a challenge. We have resources that are available to us, they're promoted to us, but there's still probably a little bit of a reluctance to take advantage of them, or there's a lack of recognition that they're needed. Um, and so I think good peer recognition and peer training for officers and first responders to recognize it in each other and be a support. I think creating a culture and an organization that's resilient as well would be really important so that we're recognizing the buildup of stress so that an officer gets the assistance they need, gets a break, maybe a shift, a shift change or a different rotation can ease some of that stress before they get to that point where their livelihood would ever be jeopardized with a fit, fitness for duty exam or anything like that. So I think that creating that kind of organization should be our goal um, as first responders. And I think the, for me, seeing, um, seeing people I've helped when they're well is one of, it's the best part of the job. It doesn't happen enough. Um, and I know that Karis uh, helped us identify and, and um, NAMI of Maryland helped us identify some individuals who had experienced uh, crises and interacted with uh, first responders uh, as a part of our course. And that was one of the um, most successful features when first responders took the beta course. And that, that really is what helps to break down that bias, yes. right, Karis, uh, yeah. in a way? It's, it's called the contact model from a scientific standpoint. Um, that was uh, uh, Dr. Patrick Corrigan um, did some research, and he found out that the best way to break down the, the stigma, discrimination, you know, prejudice attitudes, and so forth around uh, mental health conditions is to actually have positive interactions with people who have mental health conditions. Excellent. Well, we've come to the point where I get to hear from you as your last thoughts and we're going to start with you Brenda. I just really appreciate you hosting a, a conversation like this. It's an opportunity for us to to share not only what we need but what we but what we are learning as we work in the communities and and all of us in the first re responder community come to it from a public service mindset and and that is who we are Very and good. wanting to be helpful so. Thank you. Karis. If anybody needs treatment services or supports, I hope they can uh, find uh, it on our, our website with the SAMHSA Treatment Locator or the HRSA HRSA um, Health Resources Services Administration um, uh, find a health center. So there are places where people can and do get help. And as one officer, um, I heard him say, you know, hurt people hurt people. So my biggest thing is um, that for people as individuals, communities, organizations, and first responders is we all need to take care of each other. Excellent. Thank you. Dr. Al, final thoughts. 
Um, we need to expand the knowledge and the understanding amongst all the public safety realm that that access to regular mental health is just like seeing the dentist, just like seeing primary care. There shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. And as long as it's early, if you wait until you're having chest pain, yeah, you're going to have a harder time of it. If you take good care of yourself on the front end, you won't have as many complications. We can keep you at work, keep you in the game, keep you at play. And we need more? Absolutely. Training. Absolutely. Correct. Any professional wants to learn more about what they do and why they're doing it, so it needs to be available to them and encouraged rather than cut short due to funding and hour limitations. Officer Chinwell. I really appreciate the opportunity, and as Brenda mentioned, you know, it's, it's, this is a unique experience, and hopefully we can engage in more conversation with first responders and members of the community as well as the Health and Human Services uh, community. And where can they find out more? Um, can they visit uh, the Montgomery County? Uh, if, you, if you go to Montgomery County's government website, there are links in there uh, that talk about the crisis center. Um, you can certainly, you know, we work with uh, NAMI, National Alliance on uh, Mental Illness, um, as well, uh, and those folks at the crisis center. So there, there are a lot of different resources out there. Yes, ma'am. And you would recommend that for all police departments? Yes, absolutely because it's working extremely well, I suspect, in Montgomery County. I hope so, ma'am. Absolutely. And I want to um, remind our audience that September is National Recovery Month. I want you to go to recoverymonth.gov to be able to access all the materials for the 2017 observance. And it is not just in September. Recovery Month is every year. We have programs such as the Road to Recovery there. You find a great deal of materials and information related to recovery and activities that a lot of our stakeholders and planning partners are engaged in. So recoverymonth.gov, we hope that you get encouraged and do a, an event for next September and join us in that celebration. I wanna thank you for being here. It was a very, very good program. Thank you. To watch this program or other programs in the Road to Recovery series, visit the website at recoverymonth.gov. Every September, National Recovery Month provides an opportunity for communities like yours to raise awareness of mental and substance use disorders, to highlight the effectiveness of prevention, treatment, and recovery services, and show that people can and do recover. In order to help you plan events and activities in commemoration of this year's Recovery Month observance, the free online Recovery Month kit offers ideas, materials, and tools for planning, organizing, and realizing an event or outreach campaign that matches your goals and resources. To obtain an electronic copy of this year's Recovery Month kit and access other free publications and materials on prevention, recovery, and treatment services, visit the Recovery Month website at recoverymonth.gov or call 1-800-662-HELP.